Hey guys, welcome back to Dig It With Raven. I've got something a little bit different for you today. Or I guess I should say that we've got something different for you today because I am partnering up with the amazing Dr. Dave Miano from the YouTube channel World of Antiquity to bring you a super cool history YouTuber collab, archaeology YouTuber collab. And what we want to do with this collaboration is tackle some popular misconceptions about ancient history. So what we've done is come up with our top 20 popular misconceptions that we hear all the time about the ancient world and we're just here to drop some tea. So how we did this is that we split the video down into two, meaning you're going to get 10 misconceptions on my channel, five from me, five from Dr. Miano, and then you're going to get the other 10 from both of us over on World of Antiquity. So make sure you check out both of those videos. I put all of mine in a jar to make it more exciting and I'm just going to like grab them out of the hat, like a little like grab bag type thing. And we're just going to see what some people think about the ancient world. First one. Ooh, ancient people did not live as long as we do today. So the whole thought process and belief that people from ancient times did not live as long as we do today is because of, you know, modern medicine, sanitation, things like that. And it's true, but this is a really super interesting topic to get into. The first thing that we have to take into account though is that there's a big difference between life expectancy and actual lifespan. Life expectancy is more of a statistic, right? So for example, if I have two children within my lifetime and one dies very shortly after birth and the other one dies at the ripe old age of 80, the life expectancy for my children is gonna be in the middle, right? It's gonna be 40 years old. Of course, this is a really basic example because I don't math, I can't do math, but this is just how you can kind of wrap your head around it. And we do know that in the ancient world, infant mortality rates were, were much higher than they are today. And they're still very high in certain parts of the world in comparison to other countries where they're much lower. So that will definitely skew the life expectancy rate within certain countries. Everyone's like, oh yes, modern medicine has just let us live so much longer. And it is true in some ways, you know, like infant mortality rates have dropped. The chances of you dying in childbirth are much lower than they used to be. People are able to live at a much higher quality of life as well, further into old age. And it is because of these developments. I know that it's a common misconception that everyone died at like 40 in the ancient world. So that means you were pretty much an old maid or having your midlife crisis by the time you were 20. And heaven forbid, if you ever lived to the age of 50 or 60, people would just assume that you were a dinosaur or a witch or something. But in fact, the lifespan of humans hasn't really changed much over the millennia. Life expectancy is a statistical construct. Don't forget, it's our way of sort of like adding numbers and making things look fancy. And so that means yes, because there were higher infant mortality rates in the ancient world, it does skew the results. But if you were able to make it past childhood, you had the potential to have a lifespan that's pretty similar to what it is today. Hesiod, the Greek poet who lived in the 7th century BCE, actually wrote that a man should not marry, quote, when you are not much less than 30 and not much more. So like if you've only got to like 35, 40 to actually live, I don't think people are going to be waiting until they're 30 years old to settle down and have a family, right? The best thing is we do have some recorded lifespans of people from the ancient world to really give us a better idea of how long people were living. For example, the Emperor Augustus of Rome lived to the ripe old age of 75. He lived a long time. And the writer Pliny actually devoted an entire chapter of one of his books to just people who lived to be really, really old, like who have lived the longest throughout history. And some of them lived to be well over a hundred. We also have a lot of tombstones with inscriptions of people living to their 60s, their 70s, and even into their 80s. So you can see that people were living to be around the same age as, as we do today. Of course, we need to remember that the people with the particular privilege to live this long definitely belong to a particular social class that afforded them this luxury and weren't part of a, a lower class or of a more of a working class where they were doing backbreaking labor their whole lives, which really would have impacted their health. They were also probably eating a lot better and had access to medicine and, and other luxuries that a lot of people didn't. But yeah, it looks like humans just have like a, a natural expiration date that modern medicine just hasn't 
figured out how to elongate that well yet. Yes, we have fewer deaths from infancy and pregnancy, and we are living better quality of lives into old age as well. So that really has helped, but it does seem that, yeah, we just kind of conk out around 60, 70, 80, like this, just the end of the line for our bodies there. Hi Raven, thanks for having me. Before Christianity, classical civilization was free and open about sex. Oh yeah, our own culture has its myths about the past. And one myth that kind of dies hard is that the invention of sexual guilt and shame and fear by Christians destroyed this golden age of free and fearless pagan sexuality. Yeah, it's true that Pagans were less inhibited than Christians in a lot of ways. That's undeniable. Not only did they have a goddess that was specially concerned with uh, sexual pleasure, they have stories about their deities uh, engaging in all kinds of romps, okay? Yeah, and in fact, uh, at most people's homes, there'd be a pillar with the head of Hermes and it was adorned with this erect penis. Uh, this is at Athens anyway. Um, yeah, and models of erect penises were carried around in festivals to Dionysus, okay? So yeah, and you see vase painters often depicting sexual intercourse um, on you know, the vases. In comedies, playwrights uh, seem to have total license to portray whatever sexual act they wanted to. Uh, and the Greeks and Romans considered same-sex relations as pretty much run-of-the-mill. Infidelity in marriage was permitted for husbands, though not for wives. Divorce was easy to get. But, that being said, the idea that the pre-Christian ancients were promiscuous is an exaggeration, and it's a story that the church itself told. In contrast to what you might hear, there is no good evidence that orgies, for example, were common in ancient Rome. And there's another side of the coin. Sexual intercourse was not permitted in certain places, temples, sanctuaries of deities, even deities that were associated with sexual enthusiasm, you know, you weren't allowed. And there were regulations prescribing chastity, uh, formal purifications uh, after sex in some of the Greek cults. The Homeric epics um, hold back on their vocabulary about sex organs. They, they call them euphemisms. Now, if, if they have euphemisms, like things like uh, so-and-so was with somebody, you know, um, th this is kind of a euphemism that we use too, that tells you something. They, things, they say things like, they put their you-know-what, you-know-where, you know. Well, why aren't they just saying it if they're so free and open about sex, okay? Aristophanes' comedies, even in ancient times, were sometimes edited with the obscenities taken out. So, this doesn't indicate a shame-free sexual morality for ancient times. No, there were certain inhibitions here. As far as was practicable, Greek girls were segregated from boys and brought up at home in ignorance of the world outside the home. And people who talked about, you know, the proper way for women to behave said that the front door was the boundary of a good woman's territory. Yeah. And the Romans, too, had a, a, an abiding set of moral guidelines. They called it the most maiorum, the way of the elders. It was kind of an unwritten code of good conduct. The ideal state for, for uh, masculinity, what men were supposed to exhibit, is self-control when it came to sex. And women were expected to be chaste. So this idea that they, you know, anything goes in ancient times, well, that wasn't exactly true. Ooh. There were only male gladiators. This is false. Yes, there were female gladiators to scholars. They are known as the gladiatrix. And of course they weren't as common as male gladiators but they still existed. We have some evidence of ancient texts referring to female gladiators as ludia, which were categorized as female entertainers during events and festivals. It did also seem that the women who were participating in the games were actually doing it through their own volition. It was their own choice, probably for independence, for money, and for, you know, just a little bit of fame. A lot of writers openly criticized female gladiators, saying that they lost all of their, quote, womanly respect and, We'll go into that another day. But it does seem that they were honored at the same level as male gladiators, so that's a good thing. There were a few laws that were passed to forbid women under a certain age from participating in the games, which does indicate that 
female gladiators were a thing for quite a long time, and some cities even tried to ban it. But in Ostia, we have an inscription that shows that there were female gladiators still partaking in games as late as the 3rd century CE. Archaeologically speaking, we've actually discovered the cremated remains of the great Dover Street woman, who was also known as Gladiator Girl, and these remains have also shed some light into the world of the gladiatrix. Egyptians didn't have the wheel before the Middle Kingdom. While it is true that the Egyptians found it most convenient to travel by boat on the Nile and on the canals they dug, they did have overland routes as well, and there were several modes of travel and transport that were used in land traffic in ancient Egypt. Freight was transported by donkeys and by sledges, uh, carts and wagons. Now, while it's true they didn't introduce the chariot into the military until the New Kingdom, probably as a result of the influence of the Hyksos beginning in the 17th dynasty, and wagons appear in art as early as the 13th dynasty, that doesn't mean they didn't use wheels before that. In the tomb of Kamheset at Saqqara from the 5th dynasty, a pair of wheels appears in a scene depicting a city assaulted with the help of a scaling ladder on two disc wheels. That's Old Kingdom. And some have concluded that because wheels used to move things are unattested before the 5th dynasty, that wheel technology didn't exist before then. And yet, we know that they had the potter's wheel before then. In the tomb of T at Saqqara, 5th dynasty, uh, we see the first image of a potter's wheel in Egypt. And it's during the reign of Sneferu in the 4th dynasty that we see not only evidence for wheel turning in the making of pottery, but also have found an actual potter's wheel from that dynasty. The oldest pottery workshop so far discovered in Egypt at Aswan had the remains of a stone pottery wheel in the form of a rotating table and hollow base. And we know the Mesopotamians traded with the Egyptians at that time, and they had wheels, which they transported their cargo with. So, yeah, the Egyptians certainly would have known about them and how they worked. So, did the Egyptians have wheel technology before the Middle Kingdom? They most certainly did. All right, next one is... The Amazons used to cut off a breast in order to shoot a bow and arrow easier. Ah, yes, the old chop off your boob because it interferes with your archery technique trick. Yes, yes, that one. We still do that today, right, female archers? Yeah? So just to preface this, y'all saw Wonder Woman, right? Gal Gadot definitely has two very glorious memories in that film. She has not chopped any of them off in order to be a better Wonder Woman, and she is an Amazon. So if that doesn't tip you off, then I don't know what will. This myth has been around for a super long time though, 2,500 years to be exact. This myth probably came about because the Greek word for breasts is mazos, and if you put an A in front of it, it kind of means without. So Amazones ended up becoming known for without breasts. It sort of then morphed into this whole like patriarchal thing where a woman has to deny her femininity and her womanhood in order to become more like men and be more equal to them and all of that mumbo jumbo, which we know is false. In fact, all of the artistic representations that we have of the Amazons in ancient art have, you guessed it, both Congo bongos. And Homer, when he wrote about the Amazons in the Iliad, referred to them as Amazons Antianerai. And I've said that wrong, but I don't speak Greek, so please forgive me. But it's sort of a, an ambiguous term. The term has led to a few different translations, which sort of range from antagonistic to men and the equal of men. So like this, the patriarchy, the patriarchy just sucks, you guys. The Council of Nicaea determined which books were to go in the Bible. Oh yeah. Dan Brown, remember in his book, The Da Vinci Code? He popularized that idea that the canon of the Bible was determined at the Council of Nicaea in 325. But he wasn't the originator of that legend. It can be traced back to a 9th century manuscript called Synodicon Vetus. Remember, this is... 500 years after Nicaea, which listed the decisions of all the church councils. And it contains a miraculous story that holy books were placed on a table and the church leaders went away and returned to the table and God had caused the books that he wanted to be in the Bible to stay on top of the table and the ones that he didn't want to be in the Bible were underneath the table. 
but as you might guess, nothing is said about that in early accounts of Nicaea. In fact, it's not among the subjects that were said to be discussed at the council. Turns out, the canon of the Bible was debated both before and after the Council of Nicaea. This guy. Hieroglyphs were just like emojis. <laughs> oh no! I am very sorry to disappoint that even though hieroglyphs do look like fun emojis, they weren't. Emojis are pictograms and hieroglyphs are, well, their own thing. Any questions? This one can sort of get a little bit complicated because they were sort of like emojis, but they were also not like emojis. And they, they were mostly not like emojis. Let's just make sure we, we put that out there, but they were sort of like emojis. It's, it's complicated. Hieroglyphs have more than one function. They can be phonographic, meaning that they have a sound, but they can also be logographic, meaning that they just mean what they depict. For example, this hieroglyph here looks like the outline of a building. This is the house symbol, and it can actually mean the word for house, which is per, P-R, or it can also, in the phonographic word terms, actually just be used for the sounds, P-R. To make better sense of it, let's talk about the rebus principle. The rebus principle is when you take a picture and you use it for the sound of what you're trying to describe. And you've probably done this as a kid, where you see, for example, like the picture of an eye, and you use it for the sound, I, like, I love you. This became really popular like last year in the beginning of lockdown with all these emojis trying to describe your top 10 movies and things like that. That's, as, that's exactly what it is. If we're going back to this pair symbol here, it can also mean to go out. This might get kind of confusing, right? Because it's the same word as house, but remember that there were no vowels that were written down in ancient Egyptian. So that means it actually could have been pronounced in different ways. People that could read hieroglyphs already had all that vocab in their head. So they just used the context of what was being written in order to determine what was actually being said. This is again, really similar to like when, you know when we had, gosh, and I think I'm aging myself when I say this, but you know when we had those phones with the keypad and not a touch screen and you had to text by typing it all and you only had 140 characters in which to text so we shortened all of our words by removing the vowels and we knew by looking at it where the vowels would go and what it would sound like. So pair for house might have been like par, P-A-R, and to go out might have been like P-E-R or P-O-R or there might have been P-A-R-A, -A, like para, any sort of vowel placement in between before or after these consonants could have been a possibility. So the words for home and to go out probably sounded very different in ancient Egyptian and you just have to look at the context to figure out which one it's actually referring to. But if that's the case, then how do you even tell them apart? Well, that is where determinatives come in. You can sort of think of determinatives as quasi emojis, I'm gonna say. These give a little bit more context to the hieroglyphs that you're reading. So for example, if you wanna use pair to go out, you would pair it up with little walking legs to show that I'm going out essentially. And we, and we do that actually with emojis today. You know, we always add a few emojis for context or just to kind of drive home our point. So in conclusion, hieroglyphs were sometimes like our modern emojis, but most of the time they were not. Julius Caesar was born by C-section. <laughs> A common misconception that's been around for centuries is that Julius Caesar was born by C-section. And that's how we get the word Caesarian. Yeah, some even say that Julius Caesar was the first baby to be born by C-section. Well, we can trace the idea back to Pliny the Elder, who lived a couple of generations after Julius Caesar. In his book, Natural History, he mentions times when a pregnant woman died and her baby was cut out of her womb to save it. And he writes, Instances are the birth of the elder Scipio Africanus and of the first of the Caesars, who got that name from the surgical operation performed on his mother. The origin of the family name Caiso is also the same. Also Manlius, who entered Carthage with his army, was born in the same manner." Unquote. But this passage has had several interpretations. When he says, first of the Caesars, to whom is he referring? Julius Caesar was not the first in his family to be named Caesar. But he was the first of the Caesars to rule, absolutely. And the Latin allows for the interpretation that Scipio Africanus is still being spoken of when the phrase first of the Caesars is used. It's possible Pliny is using the phrase to speak generally of the first great leader of Rome, in his opinion. But whatever he meant, 
Some people took it to mean Julius Caesar. Here's the problem with that. The Roman historian Suetonius speaks of Julius Caesar's mom still being alive when he was an adult. Well, if that's the case, how did the Caesarean section get its name? One theory is that it is named after the Lex Caesarea, a law code instituted by Caesar Augustus, the first emperor and Julius Caesar's adopted son. Within that code was a law that required that infants were to be cut from their mother's womb if and only if the woman died. That law, however, was not new. The Lex Caesarea was apparently just a renamed version of an earlier law code that came from the time of the kings of Rome. The issue with that theory, though, is that we don't have the law codes from that time anymore to confirm. A better theory is that the word Caesarean comes from the Latin verb caesus, which means to cut. And it's as simple as that. Ah! Ancient statues were colorless. So contrary to popular belief, the ancient world was not this glittering, white, marble, glorious thing that we all think it is. Ancient statues, ancient buildings, they were not white. They were not just plain bare marble, plain bare stone. They were actually so brightly painted and decorated and ornamented that you probably wouldn't even recognize them if you looked at them in their original state. If you look into the nooks and crannies of statues, you'll be able to find these specks of color, these, these remnants of pigment. You'll find little flecks of red in the lips, brown or black in the hair, blue, purple, yellows and stuff on the togas, all this stuff. It's it's mind-blowing, really. Again, with this one, I'm gonna do an entire video on it because it deserves a whole video and it's so cool. But the sad thing is that museums used to scrub away these paint flecks. They would scrub the statues in order to preserve this clean, bright, white image of the classical world. And it wasn't just the classical world of Greece and Rome, it was all ancient cultures, all ancient civilizations, Egypt, Mesopotamia, you name it, they all used pigment to decorate their statues and their buildings. And you can still see that, especially if you go to Egypt today, if you look on the underside where the sun wasn't bleaching it or wind wouldn't get to it, you'll notice there's, there's color there. It's so colorful. The ancient world was definitely this big, colorful mess. And we've now started making recreations through careful scanning and pigment identification in order to get a better idea of what these ancient statues and buildings actually looked like. And they are nothing like you could ever imagine. Science is so cool, you guys. A vomitorium is where Romans went to vomit. <laughs> you ever hear of a Roman vomitorium? A lot of people think that this is a room where ancient Romans went to throw up lavish meals that they ate so they could return to the table and feast some more. Now, yes, Roman elites, they did like their sumptuous feasts. And this is lampooned in a first century CE work by Petronius called the Satyricon. In it, uh, this obnoxio obnoxiously wealthy man named Trimalchio throws feasts in which he serves over-the-top dishes. But that's satire. Perhaps more credible is the work of Seneca, the Stoic. He writes about slaves cleaning, cleaning up the vomit of drunks at banquets. And in his letter to Helvia, he speaks of the excesses of the wealthy, saying, They vomit so they may eat, and they eat so they may vomit. Uh, but... Even the wealthiest people did not have special rooms for purging, but they did have vomitoriums. Vomitoriums were the entrances exits in stadiums and theaters. Why were they called vomitoriums? Well, the name was coined by a 5th century Roman writer named Macrobius, who in his work, the Saturnalia, came up with the name vomitorium for these entrances and exits because they spewed crowds out onto the street. At some point in the late 19th or early 20th century, people got the wrong idea about vomitoriums, thinking it's where you throw up. And that's how the misconception came to be. Whew. Okay, we are all done on this video for the popular misconceptions of ancient history. Make sure you catch the other 10 over on Dr. Miano's page, World of Antiquity. I've left all the links, the link to the video, his YouTube page, everything down in the description. And while you're over there, 
don't forget to subscribe to him too. If you like this video, go ahead and smash that like button down below. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And if you like the channel and you want to support what I'm doing and help me create more videos, head on over to Patreon and become a patron. The link is down in my description below. You get early access to all of my videos. You get to partake in polls to help me decide what videos I put out next. You get some free swag and you might even get your name on the screen right here. Here are all of my socials and as always, stay dirty my friends.